this is another person that I feel very uh, fortunate to be able to introduce, like Aaron, like Lavinia, actually know Colin personally and had, have had the honor and the privilege of working with him. And uh, similar to Lavinia's story, he had a part in hiring me. So that's pretty cool to know that he approved of me somewhere along the who process and decided that I was allowed to be on the team. Um, but yeah, without further ado, Colin Stewart is of course, co-founder and co-CEO of predictable revenue. Uh, he's the podcast host. Um, I have a question. Is this double A ISP or AAISP? AAISP. AAISP chapter president and failed musician in a funny, not sad way. Colin spent most of his professional career selling 10 years before founding a software company. He enjoys sales, marketing, and product management. Take it away, Colin. Thanks, Sarah. This is going to be one of the stranger uh, presentations I think I've done. And I'm just going to see, maybe you can hide your video so mine pops up here. Mm -hmm. There we go. It's just showing your image. Bear with me a couple of seconds. I'm wondering if I hid my Zoom for some reason. Stop video. It's not. Hang on. I apologize. Just want to make sure everybody can see. But if we can't, I'm just going to I'll nuke that and you can use whatever view you like. Um, so yeah, I'm going to be talking about relevant and thoughtful messaging um, that actually converts. And, and if it looks strange, if it looks like I'm cheating and I've written my presentation down here, it's actually because my slides are down here. I don't know if you can see my monitor, but uh, this is the setup I'm working with. Yep. I'm what in a my convenient bed. setup. <laughs> yeah. It's, um, it's how we had to do things so we could get, get everything up to Twitch, everything up to uh, and into Zoom. Hey, look, I can just look at my slides there. I can only see Colin and the slide. Okay. So you can actually see, you can see me. Fantastic. Cool. I'm going to throw me into Twitch. I found the little graphic I was looking for. Perfect. So there's, there's me twice. I could actually just do me looking at me and, uh, and get a nice creepy version of me there. Um, I'm not stalling. I'm totally not stalling. Okay. So why do you want to listen to this presentation? Um, or why do you want to listen to any of the ideas that I have here? Because if you don't, then good chances are you're not going to get any meetings. You're not going to get any pipeline. You're not going to get any closed sales out of your outbound efforts. And I'm, I'm talking specifically about outbound, but I think the principles will apply to apply it equally to inbound. Um, but there's a few things I would say my wheelhouse is outbound. And I know a little bit about, um, our, our inbound funnel just from like hands on experience. Um, but I've also had, this is my, I don't know, fifth iteration of this one company, um, but call it two startups. One has failed, one has pivoted three times. So I've got a lot of, I've had a lot of failure and a lot of texture to my, to my career. I know what it feels like to hit on product market fit and I know what it feels like to grind without it. Um, just a, a little bit of an example of some of that texture that I earned at a very um, uh, recent failure. Uh, was we had actually built a tool called Carb.io, and uh, and it was we were probably about a year behind sales left and outreach, and we decided to bootstrap it, um, and we had hit on a really interesting uh, way of doing things. It was a cool tool, um, but we we hit on a great product opportunity, but we weren't able to execute on that, and. I got to see from the uh, first hand what product market fit, like really, really tight, really strong product product market fit feels like, because um, we were kind of we were growing and uh, out of the get go when we when we built the first version of Carb, it was actually a an agency where we were helping people implement predictable revenue, and we we started we went from like my first company, which was a CRM company that had like flat revenue of twenty eight hundred dollars a month, and like everything was a grind, we couldn't get any customers we couldn't get. We had tons of meetings, but just nothing was coming through. Um, and so to pivot to, from that to people hearing about what we were doing and saying, hey, Colin, I heard from so-and-so or, you know, Max sent me a referral, Greg sent me a referral, Matt, uh, all these people were sending referrals and saying, I can't believe you can do this. So that was my sort of first taste at it. Um, and then I got my second taste um, when we launched our, our tool, Carb.io, which was a sales left and outreach, I won't even say competitor, but it was a similar tool. And I, the reason I don't say competitor is because we didn't really compete. Um, we were in the space, but we didn't really execute on the opportunity. Um, but we scaled, we went from zero to forty-five, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 in monthly recurring revenue in about a six-week period. And so 
that's what I mean by like, I know what it feels like. I've seen it. Um, I, I got a little taste of it when we launched predictable, like the first version of carb with our accelerate and having that, that influx of people saying, Oh, I can't believe you can do this. And then watching that to the extreme when we launched the software product and then we couldn't actually, um, it was the definition of product market fit is that there was so much demand that we couldn't actually keep the servers alive. And, uh, and it was our inability to keep the servers alive that actually kind of cost us a little bit there. And so I've had the luxury of some texture to my early career, especially as an entrepreneur. Um, I've, uh, we've, we've had over a thousand customers um, and we primarily help build the go-to-market strategy specifically using outbound. And so from a 30,000 foot, 20,000 foot view um, we're, and working with a lot of those customers, I've got to see some trends and things that have worked. I've had the luxury of digging into our data and I'm, you know, we don't have the same volume that sales loft or outreach might have in their databases. Um, but I've been able to get a lot closer to each one of our customers than, uh, than those, those two companies um, will have had. And I think that's provided, well, maybe not statistically significant, it's provided some really, uh, really great experience and feedback on like things that work and things that haven't worked. Um, and then I also run a podcast, a shameless plug, predictable revenue podcast. I've had 150 sales leaders on there and we've talked about what works and what doesn't work. Um, and so in the chat, if I'm remembering to do what Nathan Latka just showed me to do, I'd love to light up that uh, either the Zoom chat or the Slack chat and tell me what is something that you failed at uh, that's going to move your career forward lately. So it could be anything from you're struggling with the sales calls, you're trying to work out a new cold calling script, anything. Just let me know in the chat, light that up. I'd love to love to see what everybody is working at and failing at. And so why should you care about writing messaging that, that actually converts? And, and I think this is, a, I'm gonna steal from uh, Travis Henry here. Um, he's the uh, COO over at Salesforce, if you, Sales Source. If you don't know Lars Nilsson, uh, they're a phenomenal uh, part of the community. They were, uh, Lars was big at uh, Cloudera back in the day. And um, I shouldn't say back in the day, he, he built Cloudera from uh, a small SDR team to a very, very large SDR team. They did a phenomenal job with it. And so he talks about SDRs don't add any value if you're just turning them into mini marketos. If all they're doing is going into sales loft and outreach um, and just sending emails and sending emails and taking the list that you give them and brainlessly processing it, they're not, they're, you're adding a human into the process where the human isn't adding any value. Um, and so it's, it's crazy. Um, this is the opposite of why those platforms were built. And so I'd argue that if you're just doing that, you may as well just use Marketo or Eloqua or whatever. And I, I don't actually think you should. I think the real answer here is you need to do three things. If you really want to message, or sorry, if you really want to write messaging, build sequences, build cadences that are going to convert your audience from people that haven't heard from you to meetings in your calendar, to pipeline, to deals that are closing and adding to your customer lifetime value. Um, and those three things are really understanding your customer's reality, spending time empathizing with them, not just, not just thinking about them, but actually getting in and digging deep and talking to them and learning what really makes them tick and really what keeps them up at night. And then personalize when it makes sense. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just add that I, really, I think that good messaging is really three components. Um, it's relevant, it's thoughtful, and it's human. Um, and I want to give a shout out to two other talks from this event. Um, and I'm, cause I really am standing on the shoulders of giants here when I'm, you know, sharing this presentation, I did not create this, uh, in a vacuum. Um, I did not, um, you know, a lot of this isn't really even my insights in the get go. It's just observations that I've had and I'm trying to package them all together, um, so that it's useful, uh, to everybody here. Um, but I, I got to shout out Beck Holland for her work on personalization and Jeremy Donovan for his, his work with the, and the, the whole sales left team on on the, the cadence and email tactics that are sort of backed by data science. Um, so I'm not gonna, I'm tried, I've tried to avoid those two subjects uh, within talking about messaging and sort of add, um, basically build uh, on where they've left off. All right. So as I mentioned, I think good messaging, it's relevant, it's thoughtful, and it's human. Here we go, I forgot I added those slides. Um, but the first piece here is that you don't get to pass go and you do not collect $200 unless you have product market fit. And uh, if you missed um, Mark Robert's just talk earlier, highly recommend it. We'll throw a link in the slides and um, 
I'll throw a link in the slides and you can check that out. He had some mathematical ways of proving that you actually have product market fit. But I must share that one of the biggest learnings that I've seen um, over the last, specifically looking at our customers and just feeling through my experience, is that product market fit is the, is the one big thing that really is going to move the needle. Um, if, if you don't have product market fit, if you don't have something that the market and your customers need, then it doesn't matter how good the messaging is. It doesn't matter how much you test. It doesn't matter if you send gifts or, or eBooks or gift cards, or you're doing webinars, none of that matters unless you're actually uh, building something that people need. And it's, um, the value is so great that they're like, their hair is on fire and your solution is a brick. And there are no other solutions for them. And so I'm going to, you know, the pain is so much that I'm going to use this brick, even though it's a crappy experience to put the hair out or to put the fire out on my hair. Um, and I'm going to remind everybody, Mark Andreessen's quote, that really the only thing that matters is product market fit. It means in product market fit, as he defines it, is being in a good market with a product that can satisfy the market and customers are buying it just as fast as you can make it. So with that being said, the first step here is we need it to be relevant, right? And when I think about relevance, you know, we look at the, we look at three hypotheses when I think about being relevant. And so this is assuming we have product market fit because um, I, I do believe you can have product market fit, um, but still not communicate that to your team. And if your sales team doesn't understand why you have product market fit or how you have product market fit or doesn't understand the customers, then the messaging is going to be off. The reasons they're reaching out are going to be off. And the things that they're saying are not going to be relevant to the customers. And so when I think about relevance, I really think there's three components. It's targeting, it's need, and there's message. And I'm just gonna, I'm gonna walk you through how those all fit together, right? And so when we look at the targeting hypothesis, because there's this significant amount of overlap here, right? We look at the, the company, the persona, the persona being the individual, the avatar, the, the set of job titles and, uh, that, that you are selling into. And what are the responsibilities? And I, I can't remember who it was, but we had a speaker that was talking earlier, um, Guillaume, Guillaume? I think where he was talking about going to job postings and looking at what their actual responsibilities are. I think this is one of the best things that you can do to help build this understanding. But I also believe that it's only a single point and I'm gonna get into that shortly. Um, so really it starts with the targeting hypothesis, who is our target audience, right? And then it build, to building on that. So for this target audience, what do they need, right? What is the gap? What is the, you know, um, there's a, a Great quote in Miller Hyman that talks about when they're talking about, you know, the reasons why people buy. And they say the only reason that people actually buy anything is because there's a delta between their current reality and their expectations. Right. And so what is that delta? Help me define what is the gap that's in their life. And then the messaging hypothesis builds on top of that need. Right. And so we're thinking about, okay, well, this is the need that we've identified for our customers. How are we communicating that? Right? And there's a bunch of different pieces um, that can go that go into these chains, and I'll walk you through a little bit of them now. And so, the first piece we've talked about this is within the targeting. Within the targeting, these are details, and, and maybe I'll back up because this is part of this is how we actually build our market fit matrices. Um, when we're when uh, you you if you were just on for Lavinia's, this is something that her and Kenny had built out, which is our our outbound validation program. Um, and she and they've they basically built this to help companies um, identify new market opportunities. And what they what we did in that program is essentially come up with forty hypotheses using each of these columns. We basically work out this big matrix. Um, it takes hours of interviews with the, the customers, with the prospects, um, with the individuals at the company, um, and we come up with basically tons of hypotheses, and then we stack rank them, and then we design tests to to test and validate them and get some data. Right, and so this is where um, this is where my um, this is where this methodology is is coming from. All right, and so the first step is to identify how do we come up with the targeting criteria for the company that they work at. Right? The next step, and that, that's your basic, you know, firmographic data. And and I, I'll caution you on um, when you're coming up with with um, your qualification criteria, make sure you're differentiating between sort of targeting criteria and qualification criteria. If you're trying to put who are only selling to left-handed guitar players, um, that might be relevant for Fender. Um, but if you're in a B2B environment, make sure you're coming up with those targeting criteria that are 
filters that, and drop downs you'll be able to find in tools like Zoom Info so that you can actually build this from a list because the, the, this is useless unless you actually put rubber to road. And if this just turns into a thought exercise where nothing actually changes, you don't get any, any messaging. You, know, you don't actually, if your sales team doesn't actually use this messaging, if you don't test and validate this, um, then it's just a, just an exercise. Uh, it's a, you know, may as well be something we've done in school and not actually put into practice and have a big influence. So I want you to just pause and take a look at this and think about which one of these in your messaging, where does your messaging break down? So I'm going to pause and take a drink of water and think, where, where do you think you need to focus the most? Perfect. So we talked about the company. The persona is basically how we identify the individual. These are the job titles. It could be tenure, it could be seniority, it could be a number of things based on how deep you want to go. And I'm going to rush through because I've got a few more slides or I've got a, quite a bit more and I could honestly spend just an hour and a half um, on, these, on these categories themselves. Um, and so basically, how do we identify the individual? The next step is basically is if you think about that individual, right? And so I like to, when I, when I imagine these sort of chains, I like to think about them as like, I'm building a, I'm building a story, right? It starts with a company. Okay. And I'm thinking, I'm imagining this type of company. Okay. And then I'm, I'm imagining this individual at this company and then I'm imagining, okay, well, okay. So I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about Sarah and Sarah's the VP of sales at this company. Okay. Now I'm thinking about what was Sarah hired to do, right? What's her area of responsibility? Right? Why? Why is why is she there? Right? What ties her to the role? What ties her to the company? Right? And then I think, okay, well, if Sarah's Sarah's job is probably you know among things is oversee the oversee the rev team, oversee the sales team, hire salespeople, hit quota. Um, depending on the size of company she's at, it might be like she's probably involved in strategy and hiring and tooling and all and tooling decisions. But chances are she's pulled up quite at a high level. It's probably just kind of budgetary at that stage. So I think about what are all the things in Sarah's kingdom? And then I think, okay, well, so now that I understand Sarah's kingdom, what is she trying to achieve this quarter this year? Because again, if we think about our markets and I think about the individuals, and I think about all the companies that might meet my target criteria, there are only a small percentage of them that are actually going, that where their goals are going to line up with what we're doing. And so what I need to understand are like, what are Sarah's particular goals? And, um, and what are the goals that are going to align with, what our product uh, can do. Um, and so if I'm thinking about, and those typically stem from the responsibilities. And so if Sarah's job is to grow revenue or build the revenue team, or like Mark was talking about earlier, to go from two reps to 10 reps, or to hit a certain um, customer L, uh, CAC to LTV ratio, right? I'm going to look at, okay, what is that goal? Right, she's probably got a number that she's getting bonus or quote or like has a quota for, and is going to see you know if she she really hits it, she's going to see a big number on her paycheck. Um, and then from that goal, there's probably specific things that she's going to do to hit that goal. Um, and so let's say it's it's grow from you know two to ten sales reps. Not the greatest idea because I know Mark had actually talked about most startups um, not. Um, that not being the smartest thing, but let's say we're trying to do that over the course of a year because she's got, you know, her quota. Um, yeah. And she's, she's gone through and done the math and that is the right move. All right. So the goal is to grow revenue. Her goal specifically is to grow the, grow the rev team. Now we're getting into jobs to be done. What is it specifically that she needs to accomplish? Well, it could be hiring. It could be top of funnel. She might need consultants to, she might need recruiters to actually build the top of funnel. She might need somebody to come in and teach the, uh, the part of the process, teach her team the process of how to hire effectively. Um, there might be, you know, after they've hired, it could be part of the onboarding, right? Like her team might have all of these things and we got to figure out what are all these jobs that she needs to get done and where does our products slot in? And then here's the sort of Miller-Hyman piece. This is where we actually define what is the gap? What, are the, what is the obstacle? What is the friction that's getting in her way of doing that? And so this is where we really need to think about um, and be honest with ourselves about where is that opportunity, right? And this is the best place you can find this information is your product team is and your customers. And the hope is that you're, and, and what 
you know, what you'll find in most cases is your product team has talked to customers. They had this critical insight and the customer said, yes, you know, this piece is a pain for us and it's, um, we are this satisfied with it and it's this important to us. So you can kind of map it out there. Um, but if you don't have access to your product team or you just want to go right straight to the horse's mouth, go talk to your customers and talk to them about what was getting at and ask them before you bought our service, what, what were you doing? What was getting in your way? What, what did you accomplish? Um, and that's really going to help you start to build this sort of this empathy for what they're doing um, and why they're doing it. And then the last piece in, in this chain is just how, so basically with the, with the obstacle, you're thinking about how, how we quantify and how we calibrate or how we quantify that pain. And then the product and service, the last piece of the chain is how do we solve that pain, right? So you create the gap and then you close the gap. Perfect. And so that's, that's my thoughts on how to be relevant. The next piece here is that it's got to be thoughtful, right? And I think there's sort of two pieces here. Um, we want this to be emotional, right? You want to understand if I go back to this, oh, I can't, where's my back button? There we go. If I go back to the job to be done, I really want to understand the, the, the emotional impact of the obstacle of that friction, right? I don't want to just say, oh, I know you need to hire. So here I can help you hire 10 people. You need to get to a, to an, a point of understanding where you can empathize with them and say, okay, I, I know this is a struggle and I understand that there's pressure to hit your sales plan. And I know there's pressure to hit your hiring plan. And I understand that if you are off on your hiring plan, then it's probably going to put your quota at risk and it's going to put your plan for the year at risk. And that puts your job, right? And so there's these, it's almost like this five whys um, exercise. And and you can go all the way down to the personal level of like, you're going to get fired and you're going to be homeless and then your kids aren't going to be able to go to school and blah, 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 blah. That's probably, you know, too deep down the chain. You want it to be obvious, right? And so you need to be able to get me to your aha moment as quickly as, as you possibly can, right? And so if, if you're emailing everybody and saying, hey, I can, you know, if you go too far down the, with too many whys, um, the, sorry, I'm smiling. I can hear my, uh, my kids. I got two and a half year old twin boys running around in the background and I hear they've just woken up and there's all this screaming that have, they've come alive. Um, and so if you go too deep in the sort of, in that five whys, um, it's hard for, it's hard for you to communicate in a short form media format, like an email to show your work and to back in. And so if you get too far away from that initial observation of friction, then it's not going to be obvious. And so the first piece here, if you're going to be thoughtful about it, you want to be, you know, focus on the emotion. So if I'm a VP of sales and I'm sitting in this, you know, and I'm sitting in this situation, how am I feeling about that? Right. What is the outcome that I'm expecting? Um, if I do hit this, what is the outcome I'm expecting if I don't hit that? And again, best way you can do that is get on the phone with your customers. The last piece here is it's got to be human. And I think there's, there's a couple of, couple of sides to this. The first piece is it's gotta be, it's gotta be intentional, right? If I'm, if I'm writing all this messaging for a super wide audience, then it's not going to be, it's not going to be relevant. Right. And if we are, um, so I think there's, I think there's kind of two ways. There's the, the scaled personalization way where you're, you're writing a very generic message to a larger audience. And this can be really impactful if you've got sort of an SMB market with thousands upon thousands of buyers, right? That might be the right thing to do because you're happy with a, um, a low investment, low yield. And when I say low investment, I mean, low investment of time. You're not, um, you're not investing hours and hours and hours into every email. And if you've got 25,000 potential companies you can work with um, and you're just one sales rep, I'd probably go that direction. On the flip side, if you've got only 10 potential target customers and you're that one rep, I'm probably going to spend hours or days figuring out and crafting my outreach strategy for those individual companies. And so just to pull us, to pull me up a, a level here, I want this, I want this messaging, whether it's scaled to a large audience or whether it's written hand for me, I want it to feel like it was written to me. And the way to do that at scale is to get really intentional with your targeting. Like we talked about before is, is making sure that you are nailing that targeting messaging and need hypothesis. Cause if you do, it's going to feel like it was written for me message. Uh, personally, even if it wasn't, even if it doesn't mention the college that I went to or the time I spent at X company um, or the group that I'm a part of, right? 
And I just, I, I'd say the last piece here is that it's personalized. Um, and I had some more I was going to say, but I don't think I can really add any more that, that Beck uh, or Jeremy haven't already added. Um, and so I'll just remind everybody with, with Beck Holland's approach, and maybe we'll get Sarah to jump on here because I know she's done a bunch of work here and maybe I've caught her drinking water. So I'll give her a minute to sort of oh no, to jump online here. <laughs> Perfect. Um, so there's the, the prospect created content, there's prospect engaged content, um, mm -hmm. and then there's the self-identified um, attributes. I think one of the areas where like, it's always going to be better. It's always going to be great if they've, if the prospect has created some content, but that in my experience is a very small number of people. Um, there's quite a large, there's a much, much larger number of prospect engaged content. Um, Sarah, I know you've specifically had a lot of experience. So why don't I, I'd love to just sort of get your take on the sort of prospect engaged created content versus, you know, not having anything to go off of. Yeah, for sure. So the reason I kind of came to this is because of course, relevance and personalization is the most important thing. And of course, the best uh, content to use for that is self-authored content. So initially when I started with Outbound, I found myself, um, I would have an email task, like the first email task uh, with a prospect and I would go to their LinkedIn and be like, here we go. I'm going to find some great content and I'm going to use it to personalize. And the odd person would have like released a, or um, posted an article like four years prior on something completely irrelevant. And then other ones would just share stuff on LinkedIn or whatever. So pretty often I found myself kind of having to downgrade all the way down to like just looking at their website and then posting something like not very personalized at all. And I was like, surely there's another way to do this because I know that there are people that are out there posting or that are, that are engaging with relevant content on LinkedIn, but I'm not finding them when they're like already my prospect, they're already in my account list or my prospect list, my contact list. And then I'm having to go out and find that stuff. So instead I did the opposite. Um, so this refers to, yeah, um, Beck Holland has it in kind of several buckets and this bucket is the, is the engaged content. So um, in her bucket, it's liked, commented and shared. For mine, it's just the liked and commented. Unfortunately, don't, I, I don't know who's shared uh, in this kind of approach that I have taken. Um, but basically what I did was followed thought leaders that were active in the space that I work in and that I'm prospecting in um, because they have high engagement with, uh, with people on LinkedIn that, that are my ideal customer. So um, basically, I started off by following just because I was trying to learn from them. A lot of these uh, sales thought leaders, CEOs, VP sales, that kind of stuff. People like Beck Holland, Scott Barker, uh, Jeremy Donovan, um, the like. And they would every so often or quite frequently have these posts that were relevant to what we do as a company um, that had really high engagement. And people then would comment sometimes being like, I totally agree with this. It's like a really big problem for me too. And that is what I then drew from. So instead of uh, taking a cold list of prospects and trying to find personalization, uh, I had this big list of people that I knew had engaged. And I turned that into the prospect list. And from there, following Beck Holland's uh, template with the, the trigger, um, the, I can't remember what it's called, but where you kind of tie in um, what the, the content of the person's comment or the content of the post is with the value prop that you, your company's value prop, and then the call to action. Um, and yeah, that was an incredible way for me to capitalize on the engaged content on LinkedIn. Very cool. And I can say um, in the first month that Sarah was trying this out, uh, you were 130% of quota. That's right. Um, and it, and totally smashed it as a, yeah, uh, as a relatively uh, new SDR at that stage. Um, I'm, I'm recognizing that we are actually at the 317 mark and we've probably got Chris waiting for us on the other line. So I'm going to just wrap Sarah. Thanks for jumping in and doing my presentation for me. Um, <laughs> In summary, product market fit wins. Good messaging is relevant, thoughtful, and human. Um, and finally, I forgot to do a bunch of the things that I wrote down that I learned in the Nathan Lacka presentation that I will do my best to do better next time. Um, so yeah, thanks for checking. Uh, thanks for hanging out.